When I was a student in college and taking auditions, I had this weird feeling that I would never make it as a musician. I would go to lessons, I would go to recitals, I would go to auditions, and I always felt like I had something to apologize for, like there was some basic element of my playing or my personality or something that would prevent me on a foundational, fundamental level from achieving my dream of becoming a musician. I had two major issues, what I call apology issues. One was, my hands shook when I played soft snare drum. And two was I had this basic fear of the listener not accepting my interpretation of the music, which I'll explain a little bit later. But what it felt like at its core is that I didn't actually belong there. They were things that if I went into an audition, I felt like I had to apologize to the listener before I started playing so that they understood that well, I'm not a real candidate or I'm not really on track to become this professional musician that I'm pretending to be, but I'm still here taking the audition. Imposter syndrome is really common for musicians from high school and college all the way up to professional musicians who sometimes feel like they haven't practiced enough to be legitimately showing up to rehearsal that day. So in this video, I want to talk to you a little bit about how to deal with imposter syndrome. And I want to tell you exactly what I did to get over it in my own playing. Oh, and by the way, if you're preparing for an audition or if you want to learn more about audition preparation, you should consider downloading the Audition Cheat Sheet, which is my five-step guide to preparing for any audition from scratch. You can check it out at robnopper.com slash audition cheat sheet. Okay, so I told you about my two apology issues, one about shaking and the other about being scared that the committee wouldn't accept my interpretation. I've talked about shaking a lot in other videos, but I wanna to talk to you about exactly what I mean by being afraid that the committee won't accept my interpretation. I didn't grow up with classical music in my household, really. I grew up with progressive rock. Alternative rock. 90s and 2000s rock. I was really into heavy metal. If you think about how people speak languages differently based on where they grew up, like if you grew up in the south of the United States or the west or the midwest or the east, you might have an accent to your language and actually speak it with different inflections and pronunciations. I feel like I have that with music. I have more of a rock accent or a progressive rock or drum set sensibility. I started as a drum set player and I didn't come to classical until later, like in ninth grade or so. So I always felt like when I was walking in to perform in front of somebody who does have classical music as their native way of speaking music, then they might have different musical instincts than me. I might not have the natural sense to phrase something in exactly a certain way. And when I'd go into an audition, I would always feel like the people who were listening to me would immediately be able to tell that I had the wrong musical accent, the wrong intuitive sense of how to phrase music. Because I felt like they would see me as an imposter. They would see me as somebody who was speaking a different language of music and trying to pretend to fit in in this other classical type of music. I find that imposter syndrome takes whatever you perceive to be your biggest fear or weakness and makes you feel like that's the reason why you are not cut out to be a professional musician. Really, the project of becoming a professional musician is so much bigger and grander than just whatever little issues and weaknesses that you're feeling at the time. All the work you've done on various elements of technique work, to learning repertoire, to work on musicality and phrasing, all the positive productive work that you've ever done that's brought you to where you are, that is the positive measurement of who you are as a musician. When imposter syndrome sets in, and you feel that weakness in your playing, every time you experience the pain is an indication that it's time to take a look at that problem again, hopefully from a new perspective this time. Think about it, if you have a chronic problem like shaking, maybe every time you have an audition, every three months or so, you feel that problem coming back. Since the last time you had it, you've done master classes, you've had lessons, you've talked to your friends about it, you've read articles or watched videos, and you've thought about it a lot so that you can understand it better. You've thought about the things you have done and you've maybe made lists or thought of ideas on things you still could try in your practicing or in your audition preparation to make it more likely for that problem to be relieved next time. So let's talk about how to do this. So you go to orchestra rehearsal, you experience the imposter syndrome, some bad feeling comes, you decide you wanna do something about it. The first thing that you should do is try to define it as specifically as you can. Okay, 
I suck in orchestra is not specific enough. I'm playing out of tune is getting a little bit more specific. Try to boil down the project to its most specific issue. The more specifically you understand and define your issue, the more likely it is you'll be able to find the right solution or come up with the right idea to deal with that solution. If I'm scared of what they think of my interpretation, that's getting a little more specific. What is it about my interpretation that I'm scared of them hearing? I'm worried my phrasing doesn't sound natural. I'm worried that my phrasing sounds too much like rock music. I'm worried that my musical instincts are not similar enough to the musicians that I respect in classical music. That is getting to a specific issue that now I can think of ways to deal with. The second thing you should do, remind yourself of all the ways that you've worked on this in the past. Literally, making a list of the things you've done in the past could really help you. But for me, maybe playing along with the recording, going to a lot of concerts, listening to a recording, and maybe doing the harmonic analysis of the piece before I start learning it. These are all things that should make me better at having that natural classical musical instinct, but I'm still feeling like there's a deficit there. What making this list does for you is two things. First, it shows you what you have done, which gives you ideas on what you haven't done. For instance, I've done the harmonic analysis, but on this list, I haven't recorded myself while just listening to the phrasing. I also haven't slowed down professional recordings and tried to analyze the phrasing and shapes that they do. But also in the list of things you already have done, you can find more ideas and variations on those things that might help even more than the original version you try. For instance, you've listened to recordings, but have you listened to recordings and tapped out the tempo? Have you listened to recordings and drawn the phrasing map? Have you listened to 10 recordings? Have you listened to recordings of other instruments playing the same piece? Have you recorded yourself and listened back at half tempo? Basically, the point of making this list is to come up with a new list of things that you don't know if they'll work, but they might work and they're worth experimenting with. I'll tell you how I eventually solved this issue of being scared of the orchestra committee. Every time I played an audition, instead of putting in my own ideas of musicality, since I was scared that those ideas would be wrong, I just flattened out my excerpts. And I would get comments like, I'm not hearing the orchestra behind your playing, I'm not hearing the phrase, I'm not hearing any direction in your playing. So I said, okay, if I listen to 10 or 12 recordings, all the most famous recordings, and if I really study them, if I study everything about them, if I understand every little inflection and exactly what phrasing structure, if I really understand the range of things that professional musicians actually do in the most famous recordings, then I can just copy what they do. So that's what I did. I went really deep into 10 or 12 recordings and listened to the same excerpt, and I tried to analyze and understand exactly what they were doing. And then I would go record myself, and I would try to match the exact version of my favorite recording. And then I would play by myself while recording myself, and I would make sure that I was copying exactly. Compared to what I used to do, at least now I was doing something that I felt like I could trust. And even though it wasn't original, it was still something that could be analyzed as in the classroom classical stuff because it was copied from the professional recordings. I was doing this on various excerpts and eventually I realized something about my process. I would start to have these opinions like, oh, I would have spaced out that rubato a little bit longer. Oh, I would have shown the arrival of this measure a little bit more intensely. That was the beginning of me trusting my own musical intuition. I realized that if I had such a deep understanding of all the most important recordings, then I could start to make decisions based on having that background context, and I could actually trust those decisions. I could feel like I owned the music in a way, and whatever comes out of me is something that I could trust because it's based on those recordings that I trust. Whatever I came out with at the audition and leading up to the audition would be at least authoritative enough in some way to convince that orchestra committee, or at least as many listeners as possible, that I did have this classical music background. All right, I hope this gives you some ideas on how you can think about your own version of imposter syndrome and how you could take those flaws and weaknesses that you think you have about your playing and find ways to improve them in order to lead you towards the goal of eventually not having to worry about those issues. All right, if you have any auditions coming up and you need some advice about exactly what to do to prepare for that audition from the day you get the list until the day of the audition, I have something that could help you. It's called the Audition Cheat Sheet. 
It's five major steps of audition prep, each one with a bunch of detailed little bullet points about exactly how I prepare for auditions and how many of my students have prepared for auditions successfully. You can download that audition cheat sheet at robnopper.com slash audition cheat sheet. All right, if you like this video, please give me a thumbs up below, hit the subscribe button, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.